So today we're going to take a look at section 1.1, which is actually just a preview of calculus. And to begin with, um, I'd like to kind of talk about what in the world is calculus. And the reality is that um, one description is that calculus is simply the mathematics of change. And absolutely do not want you to write all the things that are on this screen down. This is copied straight out of your textbook, so if you want to go look at the pictures in the textbook, that's why it says on your paper to, that this is coming from pages 47 and 48. Um, but this is a comparison chart is what it really is. What you can do with pre-calculus ideas compared to what you can do with calculus ideas, okay? So we're just going to kind of go through them quickly and, and kind of touch on them. So if you're dealing with pre-calculus, you have the ability to plug in X and get out Y, right? That's what pre-calculus allows you to do. But with calculus, what you're actually able to do is you're actually able to take a limit. So a limit is something that you get close to, but there may be like a hole in the graph. And you've encountered holes in graphs in algebra courses in the past. You can't plug the number in. If it does, your calculator says error for you. So calculus actually allows you to say what value you're getting close to, even if you don't actually arrive there. With pre-calculus, you're able to find the slope of a line. No problem, right? Rise over run and a variety of other formulas. But with calculus, you're actually able to find the slope of a curve. Now it's always changing. It has to be at a specific point on the curve for it to be you know, a numerical value that, that makes sense, but it allows you to find the slope of a curve. With calculus, without calculus, excuse me, you're able to find a secant line to a curve. So if you remember from like geometry, a secant line means you take two points on an object, circles when you're in geometry, and you draw a line through them, and that's a secant line. It's the same thing when you're dealing with a curve. You take two points on the curve, you draw a line through it, you can find the slope of the secant line. With calculus, you're able to find tangent lines. So again, just like with geometry, tangent lines are just lines that just touch the curve, right? Just like they just touched the circle in geometry. And you're actually able to find the slope of that line, even though there's only one point on it that you're using. Did you notice that? Right? There's only one point, so you can't find it in the same way. With pre-calculus, you can find the average rate of change. Right? It takes me this long to get there, and it's this many miles. I can find how fast I went on average. With calculus, I can find the instantaneous rate of change, how fast I'm going in an instant, right? It's what your speedometer actually says when you're thinking about driving a car. With pre-calculus, you can find the curvature of a circle, a very specific object, right? It has a def very defined um, shape. But with calculus, you can actually do that for any curve. It doesn't have to be a circle. It can be any kind of shape. With pre-calculus, you can find the height of a curve at a specific point. It's kind of like the first thing I said. If you plug in x, you can find y. But with calculus, you can actually find the maximum height. Where is it the highest or potentially the lowest on the curve? Um, and in terms of, like maybe from a business standpoint, maximizing your income, that's a good thing, right? Maximizing the profit on a business is a good thing. Minimizing your costs. So when I teach my business calculus class later today, that's where we're going to focus our attention in that class is more about the business calculus, you know, business applications to calculus. Um, you can find with pre-calculus a tangent plane to a sphere. Okay, so again, a very specific structured object, a sphere. But you can actually do it to any surface with calculus. It doesn't have to be just a sphere. Now, some of these topics, as we continue on this list, are not things we're doing this semester. So don't be like, oh my goodness, this, we're, going to do all, we're not doing all of this. Um, but this is just a calculus overview, right? So this idea of the tangents, planes to a sphere, that's Calc 3, Calc 4 stuff. We're not getting to that here, all right? But it is something that can be done with calculus concepts. Um, with pre-calculus, you can find the direction of motion along a line. And in calculus, you can do it along a curve. With pre-calculus, you can find the area of a rectangle. You all know how to do it. Well, with calculus, you can actually find the area of an undefined object, right, by, based by a curve. So you can find the area under a curve, not just in a rectangular form. Work. 
another concept from Calc 3, I think it is. Um, with calculus, I'm sorry, without calculus, you can find the work done by a constant force, as long as something is constantly applying the force, the same, um, the same structure. The, without calculus, I'm sorry, with calculus, you can actually do this with a variable force where it changes. With pre-calculus or without calculus, you can find the center of a rectangle. With calculus, this is calc 2, you can find the center of any kind of a region, a balancing point. So um, that imagery should be something like from National Treasure when they're trying to balance on the, if you've seen it, um, it's, it's a rectangle kind of shape, but they're trying to balance and not fall off of an object. We do that in calc 2. Um, in pre-calculus, you can find the length of a line segment. You've got the distance formula, no problem. Um, and then in calculus, it's actually calc 2, you can find the length of an arc. Okay, so it's a curved shape instead of a linear shape. All these three-dimensional objects are either calc 2 or calc 3. Um, you can find the surface area of a cylinder in pre-calc, geometry specifically, right? You can actually find the surface area of any arbitrary solid with calculus. With pre-calc, you can find the mass of a solid of constant density. With pre-calc, with calculus, I can't say these words today. I'm just keeping going back and forth. With calculus, you can do it for a solid of variable density, where it's thicker or heavier or more dense in one place than it is in another. Same thing for volume. So you can do the volume of a rectangular solid with pre-calculus. With calculus, you can do the volume of a region under a surface Calc 3 is this last one. With pre-calculus, you can find the sum of a finite number of terms. Actually, we do it in some of my classes where my elementary ed majors are. I find the sum of a, of a specific number of terms. Did it yesterday, in fact. But in order to do an infinite number of terms, as a general statement, you need calculus, specifically Calc 3, in order to make that work. So those are sort of a, an overview of some of the differences. What you might sort of categorize things as is that you have a lot of rigidity, right, in pre-calculus. It has to be very specific shapes, very rigid forms. And when we get to calculus, we have a lot of variability. We have the ability to take the shape and make it curved or make it arbitrary in some way that we had to have a very fixed structure within pre-calculus. So that's why I say that mathematics of change is a really good description for calculus, is we have the ability to have variability. So I want to do two specific ones, and one of them, both of them actually were mentioned earlier, um, to show you an example of how we would approximate um, our ideas using pre-calculus for a calculus concept. So to start with, um, I mentioned before, a secant line is a line between two points on a shape. So whatever the shape is, you take two points in the shape and you connect to them with a line. That is a secant line. Um, a tangent line is a line that simply touches one point or only one point on the shape. So with this imagery on my screen here, this would be a secant line. It's really thick. Let's make that a little thinner. Okay, so this would be a secant line. I know I don't have my arrows on the end, but just pretend with me for a moment. That's a secant line. And then a tangent line would look something like this, where it's just barely touching the surface. And that's what we would have done when, like, a geometry type course. Um, and then it works the same way for any other arbitrary figure. So if we want to take, I'll draw my line first because it's easier, two points on my curve. And I know it crosses more than twice, but let's say these had been my two original points and I cut through it. That's a secant line. Okay. And then if I want to take just one point, say maybe it's this point right here and I want to draw a tangent line, it looks something like that. Where it's just touching the surface in that one spot. And to be honest, it could actually touch in more than one spot. Like, let me draw one more of them just so you can see. Um, let's do it right here. If I drew a tangent line here, it would eventually cross the curve again. But we're actually talking about doing it in a very specific place where it's not cutting through the curve at a sharp um, we'll say angle, it's doing it in a very subtle way, right? And we'll talk more about how we create those later. So what would we do in order to actually find um, what the tangent line is? Well, 
We need calculus to find it exactly, but we can use pre-calculus ideas to talk about what that calculus concept is. So um, where it says um, tangent line problem on your paper, or the underneath it where it says tangent line, just cut your screen in half, so to speak. On one half, we're going to talk about what happens in pre-calculus, and on the other half, we're going to talk about what happens in calculus. So in pre-calc, we can find the slope of a secant line. What do we do? Well, we use two points. on the curve and I'll say a slope formula because there's variations of it. So something like m equals y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1, some version of that. This is what we're able to do with pre-calculus. Okay. And I drew the picture before, but I'll draw it again here. So you don't necessarily have to redraw it if you've already drawn it, but um, it has the image of something like this. And we take two points on here. Um, and so this is x1, and this is x2, and this would be the corresponding y1 and the corresponding y2. Okay, so shake your head if you've found slope before. You all have. You started doing it in middle school. So yeah, we've done a lot of slope stuff. Well, here's what happens in calculus. In calculus, we can find the slope of a tangent line. By using secant lines, or the points get closer together. So I want to show you visually what that ends up looking like. That's spelled wrong here. Um, so I'm going to draw that same curve that we had before, roughly speaking. And we started out with the points looking kind of like this, right? get a little bit bigger to be able to draw more. So we start out with this line looking something like this. And what we do is instead of, we don't move both points at the same time, we're going to say that we're going to try and find the tangent line to the first point, the point that's on the left hand side. And so we let the point get closer to the point on the left. So instead I'll use that orange point now. And then I'll draw an orange line between them. So this is my second secant line. It's still a secant line, but the points are closer together than they were before. We can say, okay, well, I, I can make the close points get even closer than that, and so I'll do a green point. So maybe I, I do this point right here now. And then I find the slope of that one. So I do this one. And what I do is I keep letting those colored points get closer and closer to that first red point that I made, and eventually it gets close enough that we say that's the value that we would get for the slope of the tangent line. And we will have a process by which we go about doing that, and I'll show an example of how to do that here in a minute, because that's actually one of my examples. But this is visually what's happening with calculus. Um, that happens in the first part, like at chapter two, we're gonna focus on that um, from a calculus standpoint. 
Um, in chapter four, we have something happen called the area problem. So let me give you kind of a taste of what that looks like. So split your screen again on this one. We'll do pre-calc on the left and calc on the right. So in pre-calc, we can find the area of certain shapes. Can you give me an example of something that you can easily find the area of? Square. Square, absolutely. What's another one? Rectangle, Rectangle sure. <laughs> How about a circle? Sure. I'm not asking you to do it, so don't freak out. I'm like, Ooh, I don't know if I remember the formula right now. I don't care. What's something else you can find areas of? Triangle. Triangles. I won't fill any more in, but trapezoids. Parallelograms, they're very specific shapes. You can do it for portions of a circle, right? We call them sectors. So there's these very rigid, specific shapes that you know how to find images, um, the area of these images. So these are things that we're able to do. We use, the way we do this is we use formulas, right? Most of which, not all, but most of which are based on the area of a rectangle being length times width, right? So the way we get a triangle is it's really just one half of the area of a rectangle, that kind of stuff. Um, circles are done a little bit differently, but there is still sort of an overlap with rectangles that's not quite as obvious. So we're able to do these very rigid shapes. In calculus, we can use the area of rectangles to approximate the area under a curve. Then we let the width of the rectangles approach zero. Visually speaking, what we're able to do is find the area here between my two sort of vertical partitions right there. So all this area right in here. And the way that we do this, and we will do this later in the semester, is we, we subdivide this and we make a bunch of little rectangles in here. These are not real good and straight, but pretend for a moment that they are. So they're not rectangles, right? But if we sort of chopped off a piece at the top or you know made it flat at the top in some way, we can imagine them becoming rectangles, right? we can create these sort of rectangles. So you can either say that what we're gonna do is we're gonna let the width of the rectangles get infinitely small, like become zero, or you can say we are going to let the number of rectangles become infinitely large. So there's infinitely many rectangles in between. And if the rectangles get narrow, 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 and there's infinitely many rectangles, eventually we get closer and closer to the actual area that's there. 
because we've got so many rectangles that the, the approximation becomes virtually what we wanted, okay? And we will do that um, when we get to, to chapter four as well. So the kinds of questions that you are going to be taking a look at in this section are going to feel like the two that I'm about to show you. So they're going to have directions much like this that say, decide if the problem can be done with pre-calculus. And if so, then do it. Or if it can be done only with calculus. And if so, try to give a best estimate of what might be the right answer. Okay. Um, some of them actually just say, um, even if it, ha if it has to be done with calculus, don't do it as well. So those are the ones we really like, right? It means you have to do less work. Yeah, that's fantastic. So I wanted to show you a couple, though, where you're actually either able to do it with pre-calculus, or I can show you an approximation approach with calculus so that you have an idea. All right, so this one's actually an example where um, it says, consider the equation f of x equals 4x plus 3. What is the slope of this curve at x equal to 2? So in order to decide whether that this is calculus or pre-calculus, what we have to do is to decide if the equation that we're given has this very rigid form that allows us to use pre-calculus techniques, or if it has this flexible variable form where we need calculus to do it. So is this rigid or is it flexible? It's very rigid. How do you know? What is it an equation of? It's a line. It's a line, right? When we're dealing with lines, that's all about pre-calculus. I mean, like, that's, that's pre-algebra, actually. Some of it. I mean, you know, right? It is. It's the stuff that, you know, seventh grade math kind of things where you first kind of encountered it, or maybe eighth grade, depending on your curriculum. Um, this is a line. So what is the slope of this curve? Curve is a general word. It doesn't mean curvature, right? It means a general way of saying a shape. What is the slope of this curve, which happens to be a line, at x equal to 2? It's 4. We didn't have to calculate anything, right? It's right there in the problem, y equal mx plus b. So this is pre-calculus. And you might even write your note. It's, it's because it's a line. It's rigid. And the slope is 4. So the pre-calculus stuff that you do is going to be stuff that you're like, well, I I've, I've did this a long time ago, or it's very basic kinds of questions. It's not going to be surprising kinds of things. Now, if this had said 4x squared plus 3, could we do that with pre-calculus? No, because that's not a line, right? It's, it's a parabola is actually the shape of it. And its curved shape, you know, its curvature is different at every point along there. It doesn't have the same slope everywhere, right? So that would be a calculus concept and able to answer, unable to be answered with pre-calculus, at least specifically. All right. So if you have a calculator with you, I hope you do, or most of you do, grab it. We're going to use a calculator at this point. So this question, same directions as before, it's just not on my screen. We're deciding if we need pre-calculus or if we can use calculus um, and explain why if it's calculus and use a, um, a numerical or graphical approach to estimate. So this one says to consider the equation f of x equals 3x squared plus 2x minus 4. What is that an equation of? It's a parabola. Right, or a quadratic, if you prefer. In particular, I don't even really care what it is. I just know by looking at it, it's not a line. And if it's not a line, I'm not using pre-calculus. That's the deal. And it isn't. It's a curve, right? A legit curve. Like, it has curvature that's not flat. So I'm not going to be able to use pre-calculus to do this. So this is calculus. And it wants to know, again, what is the slope of the curve at x equal to 2? So it's the same question as the previous problem. But because it's a parabola, instead of being a line, I can't use pre-calculus, and I have to approximate with my pre-calculus techniques at the moment because I don't have any calculus techniques that I've learned yet. So I want to show you one way to do this, and this is actually a way to do it with 
a numerical approach. So back in the directions over here where it says numerical approach, numerical means tables. All right, so kind of underline that and remind. Anytime you hear numerical, it means tables. Obviously, graphical means graphs. But I want to show you what happens with tables. Okay, so this says that we're going to figure out what in the world happens at this, to this curve at x equal to 2. Now, if you'll remember over here, this picture, what I said we're going to do is we're going to find some slopes, but we're going to find them as the points get really close together, right? That's what we're going to do. We want our points to get really close together. We want to find a bunch of slopes, and we want to say, hey, look, the slopes are all getting pretty close to this number, so this is probably the slope at the point specifically, okay? So let me show you how we do that. Well, the first thing we need to do is we do need to actually find what the what the x and y ordered pair is when we're, what we're given. So we're given the x is 2. So if I know that x is 2, I can plug it in and I can evaluate what y is. So if I plug in 2 here, I have 3 times 2 squared plus 2 times 2 minus 4. And what do you get? 12. Okay, so we're going to need that number 12 here in a moment. So we have the number, we have the point at x equal to 2, and we need to have values that are nearby to x equal to 2. And there's not like a, it absolutely has to be done this way. But the way I'm going to show you is a really nice option for how you could do it. In particular, what I need is I need points that get closer to 2 as they go down my table. So I'm going to start out with values that are bigger than 2. And I'm going to start out with 2.1. And I'm going to get a little bit closer to 2 by doing 2.01. And I'm going to get a little bit closer again by doing 2.001. Nothing special about these values. They're just getting closer, and they're kind of doing it by a power of 10 as I go. So that it makes it kind of nice. Now, if you have a TI-83 or 84 calculator, what I'd like for you to do first, because it'll be the easiest um, for entering a whole bunch of values, is to do um, an adjustment to your table that you may not have done before. So I'd like for you to hit the button that says Table Set. So Table Set is under Second Window. Okay. So if you do this, your screen actually tells you, it says Table Start. Um, it has this delta table equals a value, and then it says independent auto ask, dependent auto ask. Okay, so who do have calculators like that? Just so I can kind of see where you guys are. Okay, smattering around. So if you don't have one, if you want to look real quick at somebody's nearby you, just so you can see the table version that I'm seeing, so that when you have a calculator that you're using, and you could all, that's something else too. If, um, if you don't have one of these calculators, you might ask if somebody nearby you in your dorm has one that you could borrow even before you go and buy one. Um, because these kind of calculators are floating around everywhere. So you might even be able to borrow one and not have to purchase one. All right, so here's what you want your screen to actually say. The part at the top doesn't matter. The part that does matter is the independent, dependent part of the bottom. The part that says independent needs to be on ask, and the part that says dependent needs to be on auto. So you just move your cursor around and press enter on top of it, and it'll change it. So it should say ask on independent and auto on dependent. Okay, does everybody have that set up? All right. Then, for those of you who have this, go ahead and hit y equals, and I want you to put the equation 3x squared plus 2x minus 4 into y1. So yes, your graphing calculator will graph, but it also creates wonderful tables. And tables can be very helpful. So in Y1, right now you should have Y1, and it says 3x squared plus 2x minus 4. Okay, is everybody there? The next thing I want you to do is actually hit the button that says table. And what you'll see is that your table, so the button that says table is actually second graph. It's the second button and then the graph button. The table should be empty. It should actually show, unless you've got something in there from a previous class that you can delete out, it should show a column for x at the top, okay, column for x and a column for y1. If there's anything in it, you should just be able to like put your cursor on it and press delete, okay. Here's the cool thing, just for fun, type the number 2 into x, so underneath x type 2. 
What did it give you as the y value? 12, and it better, we already did it, you know, out by hand up on top, right? 12. That one's easy enough that we did it by hand. But the reality is, I don't want to plug in 2.1 into those by hand, and then 2.01, and then 2.001. Could I do it? Well, I mean, we could. And if you're using a scientific calculator, it will work. It's just going to take you a little bit longer, right? I mean, but it, I mean, it's doable. It's just going to take a little bit longer. If you have this already set up, you can just plug them in. You can go 2.1, press enter, 2.01, and press enter, and 2.001 and press enter. Yeah. Um, Any other calculator questions? So go ahead and put in 2.1, 2.01, and 2.001. Now, when I put in 2.1, my screen actually says 13.43. Um, the next line for the 2.01, my screen actually says, what I see is it says 12.14. But if you move your cursor over and like put your cursor on top of the 12.14, it actually shows you on the bottom of the screen that it has more decimals than that and it goes 0.3. Okay. So we'll write out you know, as many as it has up to maybe like five or six decimals to try to give us the best approximation later on. And then the second, the last one, the 2.01, it actually says 12.140 on my screen. I'm sorry, 014, my bad. But then again, if I over, go over and hover on top of it, it says 003 on the bottom. So these are the values that it gives me. Anybody not getting these values as you plug them in? Your calculator is not showing you that. Okay. So what we've done is we've taken the, and we've taken the static point two, and we've taken numbers that are slightly bigger than two, and then still slightly bigger but closer, and then still slightly bigger but closer yet, right? We've let our numbers be bigger than two but get really close. But we can do the same thing on the other table that I've got on the screen, doing the same thing with the number smaller than two. And we need to check both sides because it might not be the same from each direction. So we're going to do the same thing over here. So we're going to do 1.9. 1.99 and 1.999. Now this one are all values that are slightly smaller than two, but getting closer, right? Yeah. Right, it's like $1.90, $1.99, and then it's like the gas station. Yeah, it is. They like to throw extra nines on there. It's weird. Your calculator can do that for you. So if we put in our calculator and we do the we you know move things over and so forth, this tells me it's 10.63, 11.8603, 11.98603. .8603. Now some of the stuff in WebAssign will actually give you the x value already and let you do it for you know it won't make you pick the x values as well, just so you know. Okay, and here's the deal. I mean, as I go sort of down these lists, the values are getting closer to 12, right? And that kind of makes sense. I mean, the points, the x values are getting closer and closer to the same x value that gives me the answer of 12, right? This one from up here. So it makes sense that the y values are getting close to 12. That's, that's typically what will happen. But we're really not interested in figuring out what the y value is. We know the y value. It's 12. We could do that with pre-calculus. But we're trying to find a slope. Yeah? So how do we do that? Well, we know a formula for slope. something like that. And we have a whole bunch of x's and y's all over the screen, don't we? So the one that will stay the same the whole time is this one up here. One of my points is 212. The other point, every time I do, it's going to change. So for example, the first one space. It's still not working. I know. Okay, so for the first one, I'm going to do my first slope. So the y2 value is 
minus the y1 value that I have at the top is 12. The x value is 2.1 minus the x value, my original point is 2. So this part is going to stay the same every single time I calculate my slope. It's never going to change. So there are ways of shortcutting this a little bit when you're calculated, but probably not worth our time to explore. So if you have your calculator with you, I would encourage you to go ahead and just calculate. So you've got 13.43 minus 12, and then divided by the difference between 2.1 and 2, which is just 0.1. And it will give me 14.3. That's what it gave me. So in my table up here, that's the slope that I just found, 14.3. Let me do it again. So on my second one, so I'm going to call this M1, and the next one I'll call M2. I will have 12.1403. Again, still minus 12 over, and now I have 2.00, I'm sorry, 2.01 minus the same 0.2. So the 12 and the 2 in the end, those are going to be the same on every single problem. If I subtract and I divide, it's 14.03. If I do M3, same thing. I have uh, 2.014003. This is why we're keeping decimals to six decimal places, at least five or six decimal places, is because Eventually, you're going to end up um, with the values getting closer and closer together. And then this is minus, oops, that was my numerator. What did I do wrong? It's 12, that's what's wrong. There's my 12. Minus the 12 over 2.001 minus the 2. And that one is 14.003. Okay, so you don't have to show me all the M1, M2, and 3 calculation that I just wrote down. I just want you to know what I'm doing. Your calculator is going to do the work for you if you wished for it to. There's no reason not to let it, okay? I'll do one more just so you can see what happens when we move over to the next column, and then I'll just give you kind of the, the nuts and bolts of what happens next. So on the next one, I actually have 10.63. It's going to end up being the smaller value first, but it doesn't make any difference at all. Minus, again, the 12 over, and now it's 1.9 minus the 2. So I end up with a negative on top and a negative on bottom. They end up canceling out, and that's fine. And the value ends up being 13.7. Okay, and I, I make my two more calculations just so that you can see what they will be. It's 13.97 and then 13.997. Th those are what you end up getting if you keep calculating. So what we're wanting to examine, the whole purpose in creating this table is we want to examine what happens to the slopes as we go down these lists, because the going down the list is the points getting closer together, right? Visually, that first picture that I drew um, of those points getting closer together. So on my first list, what does that slope look like? It's approaching as I go from 14.3 to 14.03 to 14.003. Yeah, it looks like it's going to 14. And what about the second column, 13.7, 13.97, 13.997? 14. And they match. They don't have to match, by the way. They don't always. If they don't match, and we'll count on that later, we'll talk about what happens next. But these match. So we would say that we are approximating that the slope is 14. And our tables that we just created are verifying why that makes sense. You will not do a whole ton of these. This is definitely, you want more like that, right? It's probably going to be about 50-50, okay? <laughs> just FYI. Any questions on either of those? All right, so there is a web assign. You do need to get logged in and set up with that. Even if you don't have a code yet, you should be able to do that without a code, temporary access, all that good stuff for free. Um, your assignment in WebAssign is due on Thursday morning by 9.30, okay? 
Um, I do not know when the Success Center starts to be open, but my office hours are in effect, so if you do have questions, um, feel free to come by or shoot me an email, and we'll work it out from there. Have a great day, guys.